characteristically European colonizers seeking to supplant or dominate indigenous peoples, whether in Americas, Africa, Asia, or Australia, or in Ireland, have always described them in pejorative terms. They also always claim that they will leave the native population better off as a result of their rule, the civilizing and progressive nature of their colonial projects. 64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. forget to subscribe, hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Welcome to the Book of the Week series. Every week as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. My name is Igor S.F. Walker. Today we look at the Hundred Years' War on Palestine, a history of settler colonial conquest and resistance by Rashid Khalidi. So how about you slow down and relax? Reduce all that noise for just a bit. Make that choice and decide to listen. In this video, we'll look at a point of view that will argue that modern history of Palestine can be best understood in these terms. As a colonial war waged against indigenous population by a variety of parties to force them to relinquish their homeland to another people against their will. Stick around till the end. I will share with you some tools I do have and use that will help you tremendously in this game of life. Discover a way to find out what actually motivates you, what innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. I will share some tools to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. Yusuf Dia would have been more aware than most of his compatriots in Palestine of the ambition of the Zionist movement, as well as its strength, its resources, and its appeal. He knew perfectly well that there was no way to reconcile Zionism's claim on Palestine and its explicit aim of Jewish statehood and sovereignty there with the rights and well-being of the country's indigenous inhabitants. This condescending attitude toward the intelligence not to speak to the rights of the Arab population of Palestine was to be seriously repeated by Zionists, British, European, and American leaders in the decades that followed down to the present day. As for the Jewish state that was ultimately created by the movement Herzl founded, as Yusuf Dia foresaw, there was to be room there for only one people, the Jewish people. Others would indeed be spirited away, or at best tolerated. Yusuf Diaz's letter to Herzl's response to it are well known to historians of the period, but most of them do not seem to have reflected carefully on what was perhaps the first meaningful exchange between a leading Palestinian figure and a founder of the Zionist movement. Such radical social engineering at the expense of the indigenous population is the way of all colonial settler movements. And in Palestine it was a necessary precondition for transforming most of an overwhelmingly Arab 
country into a predominantly Jewish state. Late 19th century colonial national movement thus adorned itself with a biblical coat that was powerfully attractive to the Bible-reading Protestants in Great Britain and in the United States, blinding them to the modernity of Zionism and to its colonial nature. For how could Jews be colonizing the land where their religion began? Given this blindness, the conflict is portrayed as, at best, a straightforward, if tragic, national clash between two peoples with the rights in the same land. The 1917 Balfour Declaration, issued by a British cabinet and committing Britain to the creation of a national Jewish homeland, never mentioned the Palestinians, the great majority of the country's population at the time, even as it set the course for Palestine for the subsequent century. Zionist colonization can proceed and develop only under the protection of a power that is independent of the native population, behind an iron wall which the native population cannot breach. This was still the high age of colonialism, when such things being done to native societies by Westerners were normalized and described as progress. Only the British had the means to wage the colonial war that was necessary to suppress Palestinian resistance to the takeover of their country. Greater mobility, access to education, accelerated these shifts and the burgeoning press and availability of printed books also played an important role. 32 new newspapers and periodicals were established in Palestine between 1908 and 1914, with even more in the 1920s and the 1930s. Different form of identification, such as nationhood and novel ideas about social organization, including working class solidarity, and the role of women in society were emerging to challenge previously fixed affiliations. Many outside observers, including some eminent scholars, mistakenly claim that Middle Eastern societies, including Palestine, were stagnant and unchanging or even in decline. We now know from many indices that this was by no means the case. The grown body of solidly grounded historical work based on Ottoman, Palestinian, Israeli and Western sources completely refute these views. The momentous statement made just over a century ago on behalf of Britain's cabinet on November 2nd, 1917, by the Secretary of the State for Foreign Affairs, Arthur James Balfour, what has come to be known as the Balfour Declaration, comprised a single sentence. His Majesty's Government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice to civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Significantly, the overwhelming Arab majority of the population, around 94% at the time, 
went unmentioned by Balfour, except in a backhanded way as the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. The Palestinians now faced a far more formidable adversary than ever before, with British troops at that very moment advancing northward and occupying their country. Troops who served a government that had pledged to implant a national home where an unlimited immigration was meant to produce a future Jewish majority. Going into the post-war world, suffering from collective trauma, the people of Palestine faced a radically new reality. They were to be ruled by Britain, and their country had been promised to others as a national home. Zionist movement's leaders understood that under no circumstances should they talk as the Zionist program required the expulsion of the Arabs, because that would cause the Jews to lose the world's sympathy. But knowledgeable Palestinians, they were not deceived. In the 1922, the new League of Nations issued its mandate for Palestine, which formalized Britain's governance of the country. In the extraordinary gift to the Zionist movement, the mandate not only incorporated the text of the Balfour Declaration verbatim, it substantially amplified the Declaration's commitments. The clear implication of this sequence is that only one people in Palestine is to be recognized with national rights, the Jewish people. In the third paragraph of the Mandate's preamble, the Jewish people, and only the Jewish people, are described as having a historic connection to Palestine. There were people there, certainly, but they had no history or collective existence and could, therefore, be ignored. The surest way to eradicate a people's right to their land is to deny their historical connection to it. The Zionist movement, in its embodiment in Palestine as the Jewish agency, was explicitly designed as the official representative of the country's Jewish population, although before the mass immigration of committed European Zionists, the Jewish community comprised mainly either of religious or Mirzahi Jews, who in the main were not Zionist, or who even opposed Zionism. Of course, no such official representative was designated for the unnamed Arab 94% majority. Article 7 provided for a nationality law to facilitate the acquisition of Palestinian citizenship by Jews. Now, this same law was used to deny nationality to Palestinians who had immigrated to the Americas during the Ottoman era, and now desired to return to their homeland. The Jewish immigrant, irrespective of their origin, could acquire Palestinian nationality, while native Palestinian Arabs, who happened to be abroad when the British took over from the Turks, were denied it. The British treated the Palestinians with the same contemptuous condescension they lavished on other subject peoples from Hong Kong all the way to Jamaica. Their officials monopolized the top offices in the Mandate government and excluded qualified Arabs. They censored the newspapers. They banned political activists when it did discomfort them, and generally ran as presumptuous an administration as it was possible 
in light of their commitments. Countrywide violent explosion in Palestine starting in 1936. The frustration of the Palestinian population and their leadership's ineffective response over 15 years of Congresses, demonstrations, futile meetings with obdurate British officials finally led to a massive grassroots uprising. This started with a six-month general strike, one of the longest in colonial history, launched spontaneously by groups of young urban middle-class militants, many of them members of the Iskola party, <coughs> all over the country. The strike eventually developed into the great 1936 to 1939 revolt which was the crucial event of the interwar period in Palestine. In the two decades after 1917, two decades after 1917, they were able to develop an overarching framework for their national movement, such as the Waft in Egypt or the Congress Party in India or Sinn Fin in Ireland. They didn't nor did they maintain an apparently solid national front, as some other peoples fighting colonialism had actually managed to do. Palestinians didn't. Infuriated by rebels, ambushing their convoys and blowing up their trains, the British resorted to tying Palestinian prisoners to the front of armored cars and locomotives to prevent rebel attack, a tactic they had pioneered in a futile effort to crush resistance of the Irish during the War of Independence from 1919 to 1921. If you wish to colonize a land in which people are already living, Jabotinsky wrote in 1925, you must find a garrison for the land or find a benefactor who will provide a garrison on your behalf. Zionism is a colonizing venture and therefore it stands or falls on the question of armed forces. At least initially, only the armed forces provided by Britain could overcome the natural resistance of those being colonized. What the Palestinians might have done to get out of this triple bind is an impossible question to answer. In any case, they had very few good choices in the face of the powerful triad of Britain, the Zionist movement, and the League of Nations mandate. When the British left Palestine in 1948, there was no need to create the apparatus of Jewish state, ab novo. The apparatus had in, in fact been functioning under the British IGs for decades. All that remain to make Herz's dream a reality was for the existing Paris state to flex its military muscle against the weakened Palestinians while obtaining formal sovereignty, which it did in May 1948. By the summer of 1949, the Palestinian polity has been devastated and most of its society uprooted. Some 80% of the Arab population of the territory that at war's end became the new state of Israel had been forced from their homes and lost their lands and their property, at least 720,000 of the 1.3 million Palestinians were made refugees. Thanks to this violent transformation, Israel now controlled 78% of the territory of the former mandatory Palestine and now ruled over the 160,000 Palestinian Arabs who had been able to remain. Barely one-fifth of the pre-war Arab population. 
the seismic upheaval, the Nakba, or the catastrophe, as Palestinians call it, grounded in the defeat of the Great Revolt in 1939 and willed by the Zionist state in waiting, was also caused by factors that were vivid display in the story told. Foreign interference and fierce inter-Arab rivalries. After President Harry Truman endorsed a goal of a Jewish state in a majority Arab land in the post-World War two years, Zionism, once a colonial project backed by the declining British Empire, became part and parcel of the emerging American hegemony in the Middle East. Jewish Holocaust survivors, a hundred thousand of whom were confined to displaced person camps in Europe, in Europe, the American and the Zionist preference was for those unfortunates to be granted immediate entry to Palestine. Now, neither the US nor the UK were being willing to accept them. In effect, negating the trust of the 1939 White Paper, like a slow, seemingly endless train wreck, the Nagba unfolded over a period of many months. The first stage, from November 30th, 1947, until the final withdrawal of British forces and the establishment of Israel on May 15, 1948, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine began well before the State of Israel was proclaimed on March 15, 1948. The Nagba represented a watershed in history of Palestine and the Middle East. It transformed most of Palestine from what it had been for well over a millennia, a majority Arab country, into a new state that had a substantial Jewish majority. This transformation was the result of two processes. The systematic ethnic cleansing of the Arab inhibited areas of the country seized during the war, and the theft of the Palestinian land and property left behind by the refugees, as well as much of that owned by those Arabs who remained in Israel. In a third major and a lasting impact of the Nakba, the catastrophe, the victims, the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians driven from their homes, served to further destabilize Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, poor, weak, recently independent countries, and then the region for years thereafter, until 1966. Most Palestinians lived under strict martial law, and much of their land was seized, along with that of those who had been forced from the country and were now refugees. This stolen land and expropriation deemed legal by the Israeli state, including the bulk of the country's areas, were given to Jewish settlements or the Israel Lands Authority or placed under the control of the JNF whose discriminatory charter described that such property could only be used for the benefit of the Jewish people. Dispossessed Arab owners could neither buy back nor lease what had once been their property, nor could any other non-Jew. These were crucial to the transformation of Palestine from an Arab country to a Jewish state, since only about 6%, 6%, of Palestinian land had been Jewish-owned prior to 1948. 6%. Early in June 1967, the Six-Day War was raging in the Middle East, and the news reports indicated that the Egyptian 
Syrian and Jordanian air forces have been wiped out in a first strike by Israel. Washington knew Israel's military in 1967 was far superior to the militaries of the Arab states combined, as it was in every other contest between them. Thus, we're able to conquer the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, including Arab East Jerusalem and the Golem Heights, in six days. The return of the Palestinians, whose disappearance could have signified a final victory for the Zionist project, was a most unwelcomed apparition for Israel's leaders, as unwelcomed as the return of any indigenous population would be for a settler colonial enterprise. They had believed they had dispensed with them. If Palestine existed, Israel could not. Israel was, in consequence, obligated to focus its powerful propaganda machine on a new target, while still having to counter the efforts of the Arab state. Since from the Zionist vantage point, the name Palestine and the very existence of the Palestine constituted a moral threat to Israel. The task was to connect these terms indelibly, if they were mentioned at all, with terrorism and hatred, rather than with a forgotten but a just cause. For many years, this theme was the core of a remarkably successful public relations offensive, especially in the United States. Assassinations were a central element in the Israel's ambition to transform the entire country from the river to the sea, from an Arab to a Jewish one. To use Baruch Kimmerling's term once again, this one is an example of politicide in its most literal form. As evidence of the extent of the campaign of liquidations, assassinations, we have two new accounts of them, one of them based on classified Israeli intelligence and military material. The pretext that such killings were a blow against terrorism simply do not wash when the target is a leader of a national movement, unless the aim is to destroy that movement. Leaders of other anti-colonial movements were invariably vilified by their colonial masters in similar terms, terrorists, bandits, murders. Whether they were Irish, they were Indian, Kenyan, or Algerian, similarly, Israel's demonization of the PLO as the terrorists served as justification for its eradication. In 1982, invasion must be seen as a joint Israeli-U.S. military endeavor. Their first war specifically aimed against Palestinians. It was the first time. The United States thereby stepped into a position similar to that played by Britain in the 30s helping to repress the Palestinians by force in the service of the Zionist ends. However, the British were the leading party in the 30s, rather than in 1982, when it was Israel that called the shots, called the tune, deployed its might, and did the killing, while the United States played an indispensable but supporting role. The First Intifada was an outstanding example of popular resistance against oppression and can be considered as being the first unmitigated victory for the Palestinians in the long colonial war that began in 1917. Unlike the 1936 to 1939 revolt, the Infantata was driven by a broad strategic vision and a unified leadership and it did not exacerbate internal Palestinian divisions. Its unifying effect 
and largely successful avoidance of firearms and explosives, in contrast to the Palestinian resistant movement of the 1960s and the 70s, helped to make its appeal wildly heard internationally, leading to a profound and lasting positive impact on both Israeli and world public opinion. As in 1967 and in 1982, Israel was joined by its indispensable sponsor, the United States. The Oslo straitjacket could not have been imposed on the Palestinians without Americans. From Camp David, back in 1978 on, the architecture of the negotiations with its devious and infinitely flexible interim stage and deferral of Palestinian statehood was not enforced primarily by Israel, even if the framework was dreamed up by Begin and carried forward by his heirs in both Israel political blocs, Likud and Labor. It was the United States that provided the muscle behind the insistence that for the Palestinians this was the only possible negotiating path, leading to only one possible outcome. The United States was not just an accessory, it was on Israel's partner. The Oslo Accord is in effect constituted as another institutionally sanctioned American-Israeli declaration of war on the Palestinians in furtherance of the Zionist movement's century-old project. But unlike 1947 and 1967, this time Palestinian leaders allowed themselves to be drawn into complicity with their adversaries. The worsening situation for Palestinians after Oslo, the fading prospect of statehood, and the intense rivalry between PLO and Hamas combined to produce the flammable material that erupted in the second Infatada in September 2000. It required only a match to set it off. During the eight plus years of the first Infatada, some 1,600 people were killed, an average of 177 per year. 12% of those were Israelis. In the calm of four years that followed, 90 people died, or about 20 per year. 22% were Israelis. By contrast, the eight years of the Second Intifada left 6,600 people dead, an average of 825 per year. 17% were Israelis. Now, 4,960 Palestinians who were killed by Israel's security forces and settlers, and over 600 Palestinians were also killed by other Palestinians. Most of the Israelis who died in the latter period were civilians killed by Palestinian suicide bombers inside Israel, while 332, just under a third of the total, were members of the security forces. The striking increase in the number of those killed during the Second Infatada gives a sense of the sharp escalation of the violence. According to one study, the first five years of the Second Infatada, almost 40% of the suicide bombings were carried out by Hamas, nearly 26% by, by Islamic Jihad, 26% by Fatah, and the rest by the latter's partners in the PLO. The casualty figures, though, tell only part of the story, although they are revealing. In these three major attacks, 3,804 Palestinians were killed. Of them, almost 1,000 minors, children. A total of 87 Israelis were killed. The majority of them, military personnel engaged in offensive operations. The lopsided 43 to 1 scale of these casualties is telling, as is the fact that the bulk of Israelis killed were soldiers 
While most of the Palestinians were civilians, third of them children. Beyond the horrific injuries that they do inflict on human flesh, air bombardment and artillery fire on this scale cause unimaginable destruction to property. In the 2014 assaults, over 16,000 buildings were rendered uninhabitable including entire neighborhoods. A total of 277 United Nations and government schools, 17 hospitals and clinics, and all six of Gaza's universities were damaged, as were over 40,000 other buildings. The Dahia Doctrine, as it is called, is named for the southern suburb of Beirut, Al Dahia which was destroyed by Israel's Air Force using 2,000-pound bombs and other ordinances. In the face of the heavy odds against them, however, the Palestinians have shown a stubborn capacity to resist these efforts to eliminate them politically and scatter them to the four winds. Indeed, more than 100 years after the first Zionist Congress in Basel, and over 70 years after the creation of Israel, the Palestinian people, represented on neither of these occasions, were no longer supposed to constitute any kind of national presence. In their place was meant to stand a Jewish state, uncontested by the indigenous society that it was meant to supplant. If eliminating and an elimination of native population is not a likely outcome in Palestine, then what of dismantling the supremacy of the colonizer in order to make possible a true reconciliation? The advantage that Israel has enjoyed in continuing its project rests on the fact that the basically colonial nature of the encounter in Palestine has not been visible to the most Americans and most Europeans. Israel appears to them to be a normal, natural state like any other, forced by the irrational hostility and faced by it of intransient and often antisemitic Muslims, which is how Palestinians, even the Christians amongst them, are seen by many, anti-Semitic. The propagation of this image is one of the most and the greatest achievements of Zionism, and it is vital to its survival. As Edward said, put it, Zionism triumphed in the part because it won the political battle for Palestine in the international world in which ideas, representation, rhetoric, and images are important. This is still largely very true today. This mentaling, this fallacy, and making the true nature of the conflict evident is a necessary step if Palestinians and Israelis are to transition to a post-colonial future in which one people does not use extreme support to suppress and supplant the other. Configuration of global power have been changing based on their growing energy needs. China and India will have more to say about Middle East in the 21st century than they did in the previous one, being closer to the Middle East, Europe and Russia have been more affected than the United States by the instability, and they can be expected to play a larger role. The United States will most likely not continue to have the free hand that Britain once did. Perhaps such changes will allow Palestinians, together with the Israelis and other worldwide peoples who wish for peace, and stability with justice in Palestine to craft a different trajectory than that of oppression of one people by another. Only such a path based on equality and justice 
is capable of concluding the hundred years war on Palestine with a lasting peace. One that brings with it the liberation of the Palestinian people that they do deserve. And there you have it, the Hundred Years' War on Palestine, a history of settler colonial conquest and resistance. Now please do help out, it is easy, simply like this video, like it, so more people can enjoy it. Like it, share it, share it too and spread the word, leave a comment and do share your thoughts. Subscribe to my channel, stay up to date. The link to this book is in the description below. Buy it, read, never stop learning, especially learning about yourself and nature. So gift yourself by taking the free human needs test on my website and find out what actually motivates you, what innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. And if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management and relationship management even further, do check out my Master of Life Awareness program. The links are in the description below. Thank you. Love and respect.